I think the biggest benefit of having a police dog program is it gives us another tool in our tool belt to protect the citizens of Canada. And safety doesn't necessarily mean these high risk incidents where there's guns and chaos. It's as simple as saving a lost hunter or a lost mushroom picker or a lost child. You see those stories on the news, but this is something that's happening all the time. And I think to save, you know, one child's life is not something you can put a value on. Humans see the world with our eyes. So something that we can't see, which is right in front of us, we have no idea that that exists. Whereas the dogs see the world with their noses. And obviously when you're working in a dark place, or a place where it's easy to hide, whether it be hiding articles, narcotics, explosives, or people, someone running, someone who's scared and hiding. That's where the dog can do something we could never do. Prior to 1999, the RCMP used to purchase all of their dogs from breeders or brokers around North America into Europe. And it was becoming increasingly apparent that to find the quality of dogs that we were looking for, that had the traits that we needed for our police work, and to find healthy dogs and a supply of dogs, it was getting very difficult. So our management established a pilot breeding program. So our first year of breeding, we had about three breeding females and we had 16 puppies. And so now if you fast forward ahead 20 some years, we are now breeding 100 puppies a year and we have over probably 16 to 18 breeding females. The police dog service was established in 1935. We learned through the years which breed of dog was gonna be best for our police work. It was gonna be German Shepherds. German Shepherds are double coated. So the thing that's unique with RCMP members who are dog handlers is they could be working up in Yellowknife one year and get transferred to the lower mainland. So you're going from extreme temperatures, minus 30 to plus 30, but you're taking your dog with you. So you need a dog that has the versatility to work in any climate, basically. We are probably the second largest German Shepherd breeding program in the world. We want to breed for health and performance. Those are the two main criteria. If you don't have both, you're not going to have a very successful program and you're going to have dogs that are not healthy. It's said that a program our size could be probably sustainable for 20 years and we've gone past that and I feel very proud of the program that we've developed and that we have today and you know everybody is contributing to the success of our program. The more you can expose them to before they go out to their imprinter, the better for the imprinter, the more chance the pup has to succeed when he comes into training at about 14 months of age. We help mom birth the puppies and the day after they've whelped out, we start doing specific things every day with those puppies. Yeah. And we have specific things at specific ages all the way till they leave and when they get tested at seven weeks. We weigh the pups every day for the first 14 days and we touch them from head to toe. Body socialization is very, very important with our dogs because they need to be hands-on. And then we start putting them on the floor and then we continue from there. We have puppy socialization. We teach them how to interact with each other, interact with the human, and we have specific toys that we will teach them how to do. We have a little ball that we'll throw and they'll retrieve. Some of them come naturally, some of them takes a little longer. Ragging, confidence when they walk into a room, we check everything about their character. We write everything down from day one. Anything that a normal person would do for a pet, we do the exact opposite. We let them bite, we encourage them to bite, we let them chase anything, so no fear, and praise the behavior that you want. Come on, 
babies? When they're about five weeks, the first time they go out, it's more caution and fear, and you'll hear them doing a high yelp. It's stress for them. The coaxing on a daily basis will get less and less and less because they get more used to all the sounds, the trees, the sights, the smells, going up and down the stairs, the noise on the highway. So it's pretty well every day you'll see an improvement. So by the time they're seven weeks, they do it with no problem. You can do it. When a pup lags behind, we will always circle back with the rest of the litter so that the whole pack stays together. Pack is very important to them. If they lag too far behind, we'll zigzag and try to make them stay with the rest of the pack. The behavior we're looking for is for them to follow us with no hesitation. Sometimes they need a little coaxing. The more we can praise them and make everything positive, the better chance we got of the pup succeeding at the end. In Russell Ranch, we teach them how to be more independent and to venture out and explore on their own. We'll run around the outside perimeter and we'll make them go in the tires. It's for them to think and sort of figure out how to get in and out of stuff, so hence the maze. We teach them how to go in and we will praise them. It took a little while today, but that was their first time in there. When a pup graduates and become a police service dog, we're like a bunch of proud mothers. We love seeing success. I think it reflects well on us. So the imprinting starts at seven weeks of age, and I would say the biggest role that the imprinter has is to socialize and familiarize that dog to anything and everything they can think of. What I want to see is a dog that shows up in our training program at 18 months of age, and nothing is new, and nothing causes it concern. It's been around helicopters, it's been on the side of the highway, it's seen everything. We basically run the dogs through all types of different areas that they might encounter when they go out to the field. Some of the stuff that we kind of focus on is getting the dogs used to being on heights, seeing on slippery surfaces, jumping up and down from things, you know, stairways, pretty much anything that a dog might come across. We'll do some tracking with the dogs. We'll do a little bit of criminal apprehension type stuff. We have to make it relevant to where the dog's at for age. We want the dogs to be confident enough that when we ask them to do something, they're going to try it, but they're going to have that trust and that bond with their handler, knowing that the handler is going to be there to support them. So some of the stuff that might be a little bit higher for the dog, we'll just kind of give them that extra little boost and kind of encourage them that even if it looks a little bit high or a little bit intimidating, they're still going to be able to do it. So right now I have Pax. He's just under six months old. He gets pretty excited when he's coming out to do some work. So he'll kind of run himself in circles and bark a little bit, but he's pretty level headed. He's got a lot of confidence with him. He's a lot of fun to be around. He's a pretty social dog too, which really helps. I've had some dogs that, you know, have maybe struggled on some of the heights and things like that. Some maybe aren't as social as others. Some dogs, they don't like physical touch, things like that. They've all got kind of unique characteristics. At various stages through the dog's life, we have what's called validations or evaluations. And that'll be some of the people that are involved in the pre-trained section out at the police dog training center. And they'll come along at different stages and kind of evaluate where the dog's at, and which ones are maybe ready to go into training at that point in time. Good dog! Imprinting is a volunteer process that we all have to undertake. So typically if my shift ends, I still have to take the dog out, let him run around, get some training in. On days off, we'll spend a lot of times with our local handlers as supervisors and do some of the training with them as well. So it's a bit of an extra commitment outside of what your regular roles and responsibilities would be. Oops. Boy. Yeah, he's pretty cute, hey? We have our general duty dogs and we train them uh, if we're tracking criminal apprehension, the searching of evidence. Tracking probably is one of the hardest things to teach the dog. They're following, I'm not even sure how to describe the, how faint a human scent is on the ground that's mixed in with so many other things. And they're able to sort that out 
while still pulling a dog handler along behind them. So it's incredibly physically demanding on the dog, especially in, in the heat and the concentration that they must have to have and focus is just unbelievable that they can do that. So the tracking profile as it's designed is the dog will take the first human track that it's presented to. This is why we stress to preserve the area where the person was last seen. Because obviously if the members are walking around that area, when I take my dog to that area, the first most fresh track will likely be some member who was wandering around using his eyes, which we know is ineffective, when I could be using my dog to use his, his nose. So the dog is taught that once I bring him or her to the freshest track, they indicate it and they pursue it until the conclusion of the track. So basically we would start with our 10 week old puppies by literally putting little tiny pieces of hot dog wiener along a little trench that a human has walked. And then we just gradually progress till it gets harder and harder and longer and older and more difficult. And then you end up in the formal training environment. So during tracking exercises, there's an imaginary line or scent trail that a person leaves on the ground and the dog is following. And there's lots of things that can affect that. And you know, the wind, it's not like a, following a chalk line on the road. So when the dog handler is, is working the dog, they're gonna be up and down the leash. They're, that's how we communicate with the dog is, is through our leash. The dog will get to a spot, it'll lift its head up and it'll kind of fall off the track or it might come to a corner of the track. And we call that circling. So the dog just is circled around until it relocates the track or comes back across the track. And then you can usually see it in the body of the dog and the head, it snaps and then it'll try to follow again. And that's where the line will get tighter and, and the, it'll start pulling. But when you see the circling there, it's because there's no actual scent for it to follow right in that spot. So it's trained to circle around. The concept is, is that if we lose the track at point A, if we do a circle right around that point, we should find it going away from there. For the criminal apprehension profile, we're basically just using the drive that most pups have, which is to bite their toys and play with them and have fun. And we're just basically developing that and using the courage of the German Shepherd to where the dog learns that, hey, if I have to defend myself, if I have to defend my handler, or if I have to defend a member of the public, I can do this. And so we basically just build from that seven week stage till they graduate the formal training course, starting with a little piece of burlap sack or a towel, working up till you get your pretend suspect wearing the bite suit. RCMP in Nanaimo were reminding people it's not smart to try to outrun a police dog. Officers are crediting this dog named Luca for nabbing a man wanted on 10 different warrants. You could have a situation where, for whatever reason, a variable has changed. We need to have the ability to stop that dog and recall it. I didn't realize that the suspect was now going to run across the road, and I didn't realize there's a semi-truck coming. The dog's not going to say, oh, there's a semi-truck coming. The dog's doing his job. He's been told to apprehend the suspect. So I need to be able to say, hey, something's changed. I need you to stop and come back. Or I need you to just stop, maybe halfway. So it's really, really important that that's built into the dog. We always like to say, I want a dog who's listening, not just acting on what he thinks he needs to do. He should be listening at all times. So that's a really, really important facet of our training. Every dog team has a special search profile, and that would be either narcotic detection, explosive detection, or human remain detection. And the main reason we can't mix those is, for instance, if we had a dog that was trained in narcotics and explosives, and he was doing a search in an airport, and he indicated on something, do we evacuate that airport? Or do we open it up and take out? <laughs> we don't know. So that's why we don't cross train them. It's, it's, it's better to just have their own single profile. Let's go, buddy. So the detection room is something fairly new to the Police Dog Service Training Center. The holes are designed so you have a series of low holes, a 
series of high holes. The trainer will attach what we call a popper on the outside and a Kong or a ball goes into the popper and it's remote controlled by the trainer. So when the appropriate behavior is shown by the dog, the trainer can release the ball and it shoots out. And then the dog will eventually go, well, what just happened here? But the ball came out. And then they go on to more holes. And again, they stick their nose in a hole that has that smell. The dog shows a change of behavior. The ball comes out again. Now the dog starts saying, oh, the holes that smell like that are the holes where I get paid. And then all we do is we start progressing and then we'll add the sit. So then the dog goes, okay, so first I check the holes. Then I find the one that smells the way they want it to smell. Then I sit. Now the ball comes out. The room itself is actually basically self-contained with plastic panels that are very easy to clean because they have to be cleaned between every search. So there's nothing left behind that could distract or help the next dog that's going through their training. Each hole has the ability to put distractors in it so we can put other odors in it or we can change the shape of the wall. We can put things in the wall area for the dog to stand on and climb up on to search really high holes. We can make him go under things to search the low holes. So this allows us to start introducing all kinds of variables in a very controlled environment. And then we transition into the real world. So then we go to an environment where now there's no holes, but the dog should have a strong foundation where oh, there's the smell. Oh, if I sit, oh, it worked. I got my Kong or my ball. So basically that's the premise behind the wall in a very small nutshell. <laughs>once a year every dog team gets tested so we have to certify every dog team once a year that they're they're able to make sure uh, their tracking is up to snuff they have control of their dogs um, that they're able to search for the things that they're able to search for whether that's explosive narcotics or human remains um, so we certify our dog teams once a year on that so this morning was a validation scenario that we put our handler through and essentially it involved a track a criminal apprehension portion of it, a small article search, and urban search, which would have been a search in an alley. And the scenario was, was it was a, a break into the vehicle and the guy took off running. So it was about 20 minutes before she started. We had a person that walked a designated route and it was through the municipality. We cut through some yards and went up some alleys and just different terrains and things like that. At the end of the track, we had our quarry pop out from a hiding spot and to continue to flee from the dog. And what we were looking for there was the dog to be deployed to use as an apprehension tool to, to capture that person. So that's what we were looking for at the end. The person gave up, the dog came back, then he continued to run again, so we sent the dog again. And so these are all testing parts that we're looking for to satisfy that when we're doing the annual validation, we need to show that the handlers always have control of their dogs. And then she had to do some searches after that. So we had simulated some items being stolen from the vehicle, some bigger ones that were in that alley that the dog had to find. And then back at the vehicle, we had told her that we were missing some keys and it looked like he threw those as he was first running away, so she had to then try to come and find the keys. So yeah, it was a, a, a fairly inclusive uh, scenario she had to work through. Training of the dogs is never, ever finished. Our courses here are basic training. We give them the basic skills to go out and to operate in the field. But when you're out in the field, you're constantly doing maintenance training. You're constantly trying to advance your skills. You'll encounter new things all the time and then we will try to come up with some training to help us better accomplish our goals in the future through those new challenges. So the training for the dog and the handler is, it'll, it starts when they come here and it never finishes until they retire.
So upon successful completion of the 85 day training course, uh, the handlers would be given their graduation certificate and then sent off to learn how to truly do the job. It's basically the same as when you leave depot. Like, yeah, you're a police officer, but now you're gonna learn how to be a police officer in the real world. So basically training is, is as realistic as we try to make it, it's controlled. So same with these dogs and these dog handlers, when they finish this 85 day course, they've finished a controlled course, a controlled environment. Now they have to go out and train themselves and their dogs for the real world and to be the most successful dog handler they can be. We have a small ceremony, so all the staff at the Police Dog Service Training Center, all the other candidates who are in training would come to the classroom and then watch the certificate presentation. You get a challenge coin that only dog handlers are allowed to have. So that challenge coin is given to the handlers. And then as well, something that was recently started, which is like really, really, really cool, is when you finish the course, whether you're a retrain or a new dog handler, we steal your Velcro name tag and we put it up on the wall. So basically every person who's been trained at the Police Dog Service Training Center has their Velcro name tag up on the wall. So hopefully that'll be around for a long time after we're all no longer here. Being a police dog handler is the hardest job by far in the RCMP, in my opinion, but it's by far the most rewarding job in the RCMP. You know, we always say it, we're the tip of the spear. We're at the very front. So I think it speaks to the character of the people that wear the dog handling uniform. You know, we always tell people this is a lifestyle. It's not a job, you know, it's, it's your partner. But not only is it your partner, it's like, I spend way more hours with my police dog than I do my family. So like that bond is, I don't think there's a bigger bond than that. So. Best job in the RCMP, police dog handler, <laughs> without a doubt. <laughs>